Okay, our last speaker for the session is Ken Dunham, who's going to tell us about mass fraud. I assume that's something the Pope does, but I think we'll be finding out about that. Thank you, John. Check, check. Do we have sound? Thank you. Thank you, John. Dobre den. Well, I hope you've had a good time here in Prague. I've enjoyed it myself. I've been here since Saturday. It's been great. I'd like to know, though, how many people here in the last 18 months have known someone in their personal lives that has suffered credit card fraud of some type? Raise your hands. Someone that you know in your personal life that has, that's it for credit card fraud? Really? Okay, now, how many people here have personally suffered credit card fraud and had to have their cards changed? Okay. Now, of those, how many people have actually had fraud because they went to a gentleman's club in the last 24 hours and they don't want to admit it? <laughs> Put your hand down. Yeah, all right. <laughs> well, I've been doing this since, uh, does anybody know what year I started in antivirus research? 1989. So that's why I have a lot of letters behind my name, because I'm old. But I will say that uh, things have changed quite a bit since the day of uh, file and floppy infectors and uh, simple viruses. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. The focus is on point of sale malware trends. And I'm going to be talking about the greater adversarial contextualization of what we have going on in the marketplace globally. Uh, it's going to focus less on hardware and things like what our keynote discussed and more on understanding the governance and the marketplace and what we're dealing with in terms of threat assessment. So that's what I'm going to focus on. But first, I just want to let you know that I've been here since Saturday and I've been traveling quite a bit. And I've had a really good time. And I have lowered my risk by spending all my money before I lost my wallet. Of course, I'm a Bill Murray fan because I'm an old guy, right? Got to love it. But I want you to think ahead here. At the end of the talk, we're going to have a little bit of a discussion about how you lower your total risk exposure, right? And the impact of potential point of sale fraud risk and other types of fraud that might come in the future with the way that we do our transactions. I want you to think preventatively and from a point of mitigation. In this case here, Bill Murray, it, it's, it's going for him that he already spent all of his money, so when he lost his wallet, he really doesn't care. What is going for you when it comes to point-of-sale malware? Is there anything going for you in the way you're running your business or the way that our merchants are handling the transactions or the way that the card members and the various protocols that are being implemented? Is there anything in that picture that's going for us? Think about that. Well, this is a website that, after I lost my wallet, I went to just to see if my credit card had been compromised. In fact, you can go there now because you can hook up to Congress. I know it goes back and forth between Congress and Clarion down here, but you can hook up on your mobile device right now, actually, and go to this website. And, and I'd like you to fill that out with your credit card and your uh, expiration date. And then raise your hand if you've checked it and it actually shows that you've been defrauded. Okay, yeah, you've done that. I see you smiling. Yeah. All right. Well, I made sure the domain was not actually existent when I actually did the presentation, okay? But there are actually in the underground phishing pages and things that look just like this. It looks really legit, right? But it isn't. I sure hope somebody doesn't create that domain name now. I'd feel bad about that a little bit. All right. Well, a decade ago, when I was doing underground counterintelligence, I was able to scrape over a million credit cards a day that were new, live, and valid. And I had track one details, and it was trivial to perform. Those cards were still good. They had not been monetized. They had not been used in any way. And in some cases, they would stay on the market or be exposed in various public fashions for weeks or months. Do you think that's the case today? Not at all. Because back then, getting all the data, big data in a big crime world, was a big deal. But they didn't have monetization strategies in place. They didn't have money mules. They didn't have the ability to do the laundering and the movement in and out of various banking institutions in various countries and across you know, transcontinental. It's a problem on how you actually monetize that asset. So things have changed quite a bit. 
for the bad guys. I want you to put on your head thinking about the bad guys. With that in mind, we've had quite an evolution of threats. Back in the day, we had simple Trojans, viruses, just little knockoff threats that really were very newsworthy and they were interesting, but literally, they were just trying to get a picture of a girl on her cam or something. It was stupid, child's play. But we also had some people that had been going after the gold for some time. And we have had this natural transition towards e-crime, espionage, and major assets that are now interdependent upon our technology. And so with that, we've seen a major transition. And I gotta tell you, from a bad guy perspective, what is perhaps one of the worst things that's happened in the underground for us as good guys? In the last 10 years, if you just thought about it, what is it, the Russians, the Chinese, the Romanians, pick your country, right? Because everybody's in on it, even if they don't admit it. Is that the worst case scenario, that we have nation state and other things? Well, I would say that it has more to do with capabilities and that source code releases was a really big deal when it comes to e-crime. Think about it. Back in the day, anybody remember Agabot? He didn't live too far from here, remember? Yeah, and Agabot was like the bot back in the day. We'd all, the, the security researchers that have been going here for 10 plus years, we all know who he was, right? Well, Agabot then was developed into something known as Fatbot, and then the source code was released. And this was bar none, the number one bot in the world, and it was really amazing, comparable to anything else in the wild at that time. And the source code was released for that. What happened after the source code for Fatbot was released? We had the year of the bot, right? With thousands of bots and knockoff bots, why? Because now we have heavily commented code readily available, very easy to work through, and we have now empowered and enabled through training, access, and assets, the ability for the bad guys to do bad things. And over this year, or over this uh, decade rather, we have also had a significant number of highly skilled people being trained specifically for counterintelligence and adversarial capabilities. People that have been working on this from an e-crime perspective. So you've got highly skilled actors with the best code in the world. Remember uh, Craig's, uh, he called it My Doom? Is Craig in the room? I don't see Craig here. But My Doom was the number one email threat back in the day at that very moment until the next big one came along, right? And what happened with My Doom? There was a My Doom A and a B. Some people might remember this, right? And then a quote unquote C, or do you call it something a little different? But boom, what happened within a two week period was a massive infestation and then the source code was dropped on every single computer that had it possibly as a way to uh, avoid, you know, to have plausibility, deniability in case they got arrested. They're not the only guy in the world with the source code for the worm. So we've had a lot of things making it easy for the bad guys. Now we've also had a change in the way that things are done as well, because we've had maturation moving from singular, like with Trojans and viruses that were knockoffs, right? to automation and full-scale capabilities. I remember Metafisher back in, what was it, 2006, where it moved to a web-based CNC model, and we we're like, wow, that is gonna be totally the future, because that is a great way to have a lot of computers, and you can do all kinds of domain and IP games, and now we have um, fast flux, we have bunny flux, whatever you wanna call it, fluxing, we have DGA, all kinds of fancy little acronyms to say that there's a moving target out there. So let's look at the vectors of attack, focusing in on point of sale malware. And oh, by the way, if you didn't know, I'm an incident responder by trade. So pretty much every single major event that's happened this century, I've been on it or I've been lead, okay? So I'm talking with the experience here. What do we often see as the number one kind of issue? It's people, right? It's the old chain to keyboard, or uh, what is it? Keyboard to computer error, right? Yeah, the, the human. And that's what we're seeing there. A lot of times with point of sale fraud, you're dealing with people that are disgruntled or they're financially desperate, they're into drugs, they're having problems in their personal life, or there's some kind of a motivation for them to hurt your company. But bottom line is that's kind of the insider threat. But the one that actually happens more frequently in point of sale fraud from what I have seen anecdotally is not the disgruntled insider, but who? The one I have not yet mentioned. 
The one that's kind of an insider, but not really. The one that's trusted inside of your network is who? Yeah? Huh? Maintenance guy, yeah, exactly. It's your trusted contractors, right? It's going to be your janitor. It's going to be the guy that has HVAC system capabilities. It's going to be your, the guy that comes in and does patching on some third party whatever, and he's got access to it. And you don't have governance and control over his system, do you? You don't have governance and control over his behavior necessarily. And whatever he does inside of your network, you may not be watching that very closely either. So with all that in mind, third party and or uh, people that have elevated rights that should not have it are really more the issue. And a lot of times it's through some kind of a VPN connection. We also have skimmers. And those can be used to collect your credit card details. But this isn't really point of sale proper, uh, like what we think about when we think of point of sale malware, right? Like actually on the terminal. But this is a point of uh, compromise that you should be aware of. Uh, people can put these inside of their clothing and they can do a double swipe. They, they head over to the register. You don't know what they're doing with your credit card, right? And they can easily swipe it in their clothing and you wouldn't even know. And then we've got point of sale terminals, which is what most people think about when you have come to a talk like this. You're thinking, oh yeah, that was actually compromised. Okay, well that's true. Those have had compromises on them. And some of those have access to the internet where you can do direct exfiltration of the data in real time and some do not. In fact, some are segregated so that they're only on an internal LAN, but that internal LAN has to get out somewhere in order to do authentication to make sure your credit card works and we have the funds and it's authorized, right? Now, if I'm looking at it, when I say that, it's nothing personal, okay? <laughs> and then we have the database, the back end. Don't forget about this. Architecturally, if you're a bad guy and you have access to the database in the back end, even if it's encrypted, you're going to try to get at that, right? And there are point of sale malware attacks that have taken place on the back end, believe it or not. And they are very sophisticated. They know what they're doing. And what about the future? The use of Square and other similar mobile devices or uh, the ability to just take your Apple Pay phone and whoosh, just magically happens, right? Isn't that awesome? I have a, a phone like that. I think it's cool. Well, it's totally convenient. People love it. But there's a reality to the fact that as we adopt these new technologies and solutions and we make it easy, right, convenience, that of course naturally, as we all know, anybody who's been in security longer than two minutes knows that you're going to pay a price on your security, right? Okay. So we're dealing with an issue now where counterintelligence with the bad guys in point of sale, in particular point of sale, this is perhaps the most important component here, the red line, that they are actually doing counterintelligence against your entire network. They don't want to just have access to the one terminal. They want to have access to your entire chain of stores. They want to have access to one computer. They want to map out the whole network. They don't want to just get in there and get out. They want to own it for a long period of time. And in most cases, most breaches are how long before people know about them? 200 plus days, according to many studies. And even after you see fraud losses on the cards and you're told as a company that you may have a problem with your department store and your point of sale, how long do you think it takes for you to find it if you didn't even know it was there and you only see the losses? How many people think one week? You could find it. If you were told you're having losses that are directly attributable to your customers, you probably have a point of sale malware. How many people think they could find it in a week on their network? Two weeks? Three? No hands, four weeks, takes a month to find it. How about two months? Three months? Yeah. It's a troubling reality, and we all know there are some networks that are better architected and governed than others, right? And in most cases, they don't know and they can't find it. And given the skill of our adversaries and the counterintelligence they put in there for two-thirds of a year before they start to do mass fraud during the holiday season or something, they've prepared for your counter response. They want survivability. This is not about surviving a reboot. This is about longevity on your network for maximum fraud. You're not gonna shut your business down. We're not gonna do some kind of denial of service threat 
to try to say, we'll shut you down right before the horse races like they used to do in the UK back around the turn of the century, right? We're talking about owning you, you know you're owned, and we continue to own you while you continue to do business. Ouch. So let's look at the wins and losses for the good guys and the bad guys in blue and in red. On the left, we have the merchants, the point of sale providers, people like that, consumers, we're losing. And on the right, we have the adversaries who are winning in every category. And these are just anecdotal, by the way. As we take a look at this, we see that reputational risk and the magnitude of loss is significant. Millions of dollars for these various companies that have had breaches, they've had to tell people, people don't shop at their stores. They get rid of their cards. They don't go there anymore, ever again. And then do you think it matters after we've had so many disclosures, so many companies that have been compromised or point of sale fraud? I mean, can you go to any store and assume that you're safe? Does anybody do that? I don't think so. So with that, we have a high impact, and it's very personal to you once it happens to you. And I wonder how many merchants are out there wondering when it's going to happen to them, not if, but when, right? We know in the antivirus world that people moved away from the concept slowly but surely. Some still haven't gotten there, but most have. They realize they're going to have virus infections. It's an accepted risk. But they have controls in place like antivirus, firewall, etc., so that they can minimize the magnitude and the impact of those. And if they do have a risk, they have got procedures in place like a guy like me that would go in and do incident response and stop the bleeding and minimize the damage and the impact. So we've been able to do that in the world of antivirus. But do you think that point of sale and merchants out there have that capability? Are they used to even dealing with these kinds of threats and having those kinds of controls and countermeasures and response plans? Not at all. I can tell you, I've been shopping here in the Czech Republic. They've been here for a very long time, and they do not have these controls in place. They are owned if it comes to that, and they have that kind of fraud. Trivial. Number two, we have supported legacy issues. Even in the United States where they're rolling chip and something or other, it's not truly just a dedicated chip and pin. Our keynote did an outstanding job of talking about the uh, actual movement of hardware and, and the vulnerabilities of hardware components, right? But I want you to think about this from a, a rollout perspective, especially in the United States where it's low-hanging fruit. Because we know in Europe, they largely use what kind of cards? Something smart, EMV, right? But if we look at the United States comparatively on a global basis, the United States where most of the POS-based fraud disclosures have taken place in the last 18 months, we see that they are only using the mag stripes, and that's where it's easier to monetize. And even if we move over to, to some kind of smart solution, like I've got a card right here, and this is an example of a US-based card that now has a chip, okay? But it also has a magnetic stripe on the back. So it's not dedicated to just that chip technology. They have to have the magnetic stripe because there's too many vendors that only do the old solutions and legacy solutions. And it truly is about a liability shift. That is a big deal. And I believe that we're going to see major changes in that landscape over the next five years because of the massive amount of fraud that's looming. We're headed for a cyber Gamora, okay? I believe we're headed for a cyber Gamora. And such an infestation and a maturation of the wickedness in the e-crime world that uh, with our interdependence on technology and the rapid pace of how we're doing things, it's going to be very evil. And we're going to lose first before we start to have wins. So we have legacy issues and adoption issues, liability issues with the various merchants. We have poor governance. They don't even know how to roll it out or manage the security, let alone figure out the taxes and go in there. And I'm not trying to say people are stupid. These are complex systems. They've got other problems to solve. And especially small businesses, they don't need to be worried about that kind of thing. And yet, they have these point-of-sale terminals, very vulnerable. Imagine being a small liquor store and having a contractor who uh, is servicing your computers or your point-of-sale or something else. And then next thing you know, uh, you have an infection on your machine. And that then leads to point-of-sale malware. Well, now your entire system and your bank accounts and all of your clients are all at risk. All of those assets, not just one. Everything is at risk 
for loss. And we've got little to no incident response capabilities. Like we said before, it can take days, weeks, months for you to mitigate it or even identify the stupid thing because it can be very difficult to find some of these uh, codes. They're not just like an executable sitting right there. They might be fileless or they uh, may be something we haven't seen before and it may be very difficult to identify and track it down. Uh, and the ways that they go about the capturing can be very dynamic and diverse. So on the left, we have a high risk and low reward. And on the right, we have low risk and high reward. And that means that uh, we're promoting, with the way we do things today, e-crime. And I like uh, one of the sessions, of course, we had a discussion over monetization and cost and other things. And Apple devices were considered to be uh, a little bit less targeted. Why? Because of the cost of the developer and other things. Bottom line is the ROI went down for Apple-based products comparable to, say, Android, okay, because of the model and the way that we're impacting the bad guys when they try to perform fraud. And there's a lot to be said for that. We have to put a dent in their ROI while increasing our ROI and lowering our total fraud losses. It is a numerical issue. Like I said, I believe it's a Sodom and Gomorrah. It is truly a tidal wave. This is about how we do business, okay? So our transactions are changing. How many people here have been using credit cards while they've been traveling? Yeah. How many people have used check? You got to use check in some cases. Anybody use actual uh, cash? Yeah, you got to get on the metro, right? Something like that. And so you're going to maybe do that. A lot of small businesses, that's all they accept. They won't even accept a card, right? So you're going to you're going to do both of those. And I believe we're going to do more things related to our mobile or our virtual identity, especially through our phones. Our phones are becoming very quickly our social security cards of tomorrow. We have convenience and safety. Uh, we even have exchange rate issues. I got to tell you, if I go down to the marketplace, they tried to charge me 20% down in the old town square to do a freaking exchange. And I'm like, nay, I know enough to say that in check. And uh, next thing you know, I got a 7% rate. Well, you know, that's, that's nice. I appreciate that. Well, if I go down to the ATM, how much am I paying on my card to cash out? 2%, right? And I'm putting my debit card at risk, potentially for a skimmer, but there are reasons why people are using these cards and why we're going to see more use of these in adoption. And in fact, we see that, look in the picture, you'll notice that one of the images that we have up here is Chinese. And China and Japan have gotten into this culture of debt management and spending and credit cards. And we're seeing a massive explosion of that in Asia in particular. So our culture has changed globally now towards this. At the same time, rapid adoption of mobile. So point of sale continues to emerge while the crime develops. We have a lot of victims. And in some cases, like the FBI said, over a thousand businesses infected with the back off. But is that one actor, one group, or are that multiple people using the same code? Anybody know? It's interesting. But the scale of that is staggering because prior to that, nobody even knew and it wasn't, dis well, some people knew, but it was not disclosed, okay? And what about things like the Kartosha campaign? And Chewbacca, I love that name. That's a great name. I don't know who came up with that, but way to go. I, I like Star Wars too. My dog's name is Chewie, so that's a pretty awesome name for a point of malware. But we have a lot of different kinds of codes. And more importantly, if you understand your taxonomy and functionality capabilities, we take a look here. Look at this here. When we go across this, we're moving into things that are botnet related. And we're looking at marketplaces with USD and Bitcoin. We've got 32 and 64-bit uh, type payloads that are deployed, uh, increased sophistication. We've got mail slot exfiltration here. So you can do real-time stuff that you wouldn't expect to see necessarily uh, if you do have the ability to do exfiltration. And that means based upon the protocols and the internet accessibility, your LAN architecture, et cetera. And then we have people moving towards 
near field communication payments and that sort of thing. So I think we see a dramatic change in the way we're adopting culturally and the way we're going to be doing our transactions. Meanwhile, we haven't taken care of business on the point of sale front in terms of hardening a security. So really it is an access of futility. And that is the sad reality of where we're at. We always see this action reaction in the world of security. You've been in it more than five years. And we saw that with bots and we saw that with macroviruses. It's interesting now how we killed off macroviruses around the turn of the century, how we see so many now coming back in, right? And what I'm seeing businesses do anecdotally are employing HIPs or other kinds of controls to more uh, accurately and granularly stop actions like, say, opening up a macro and then writing to a drive or performing some kind of network communications that would not normally be expected in a business place. But it is an act of futility to some regard. Small businesses are under-equipped, understaffed, and they don't understand, and they don't want to. And it's going to cost them a lot of money to avoid the liability. So eventually, they'll buy that big, expensive processor, and they won't like it. They'll probably have to pay increased transaction fees for every card they process. It'll hurt them, and that will be passed on to you as a consumer. Do you remember in 2003, back in the day, where we had credit cards but no monetization? Now that monetization is in near real-time or real-time, and you might even get a call a couple minutes later, somebody asking for an OTP or something else that they might need, and literally performing that transaction to take money out of your bank account while they're freaking talking to you on the phone, okay? Very fast, very different than 10 years ago. This represents maturity of the marketplace for monetization and laundering and the ability to move that money around. Whereas before it was about big data for them. We're just now talking about DLP and other things in our space. So as we start to talk about chip and pin, and will it really make a difference? And I'm finishing up here with the last slide or two. I want to ask these questions within the framework of what do we know about these cards, right? As you look at the anatomy of a credit card, you have track one, track two data. Usually both tracks are red, so that if one isn't red properly or there's corruption, the other one's a redundant backup. Track three isn't often used. And of course, there's a method to the madness. If it starts with a four, I know it's a visa. If it starts with like a five, one, a 55, somewhere in that range, it's gonna be a MasterCard. That's just how it works, okay? And you have bin numbers, and yes, that's a legit website where you can go look it up so you can see the bank identification. But will chip cards and EMV actually change anything? And the answer is yes. It'll drive up our costs of card manufacturing and management. It'll drive up the costs for the merchants. As we take a look at these new cards, the bottom line is, is that there's a lot of ways to implement it, and there's diversity within the marketplace. They all have their own ways of doing it, but they are making an effort, and it does help with the security to some degree, but it doesn't stop e-crime attacks and losses. It changes how they monetize, but it doesn't stop the collection of assets and card numbers and pins or other things that may come with that. And the monetization is still trivial in card not present type transactions, chip or no chip. So future considerations on my last slide here, I want you to think about, does it really matter? And I think it does. If you don't have some of these devices in the next few years in the United States where they're moving away from the old mag stripe and towards more of what Europe has traditionally adopted, I think that liability will shift towards those small businesses. And it'll put some businesses out of um, business. It'll take some people and they'll lose their jobs as a result of it. And I believe eventually we're going to have to have a different distribution model for the way liability is shifted for consumers. And there has to be responsibility for everybody from the consumer all the way up to the card, the transactors, and the people in the background that are managing it. It is a governance issue overall. <clears throat> And we're moving more towards a virtual identity to where I believe near-field communications and our phone, our mobile devices are going to completely change the way that we do things. If you can do it with your device, why would you even carry a card or cash to some degree? But of course, you go to old world areas, you're going to still need cash in some cases. I think we'll have to wrap it up there. That is it. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you.